Good morning, church. Good morning. Wow, excellent job from the front up here. So glad to uh, have you together. Oh, I forgot something I, that I, def- I, have, I, have, I have one. Thank you, Megan. So, hey, this is Palm Sunday. And that doesn't just mean we give high fives to each other with our palms. That means, thank you, Mindy. You, yeah, dad, dad joke. So welcome to worship. Let me start over. Welcome to worship, church. So glad you're here. If you're watching online, really glad that you can be a part of us today. And on this first Sunday for many of spring break, it is also a very special Sunday in the life of the church because this is Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, we remember this scene in Scripture that is so profound uh, that many of us might still think of it in a, in a, and not as a profound thing, but it really is profound, that Jesus uh, chose to enter the city where he knew what was ahead. He knew what was coming. He knew that even though as he came in, people waved their branches and threw down their cloaks, and he came in in the proper way of a king, being greeted, and as the people shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means salvation. They were crying out for him to be the one who would bring God's salvation. Blessings to him. They were giving praise to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were shouting his praises and shouting Hosanna and waving their branches as a sign of his welcome and the entrance of the king. He knew that just in days... Uh, they wouldn't be shouting Hosanna in the same way, that they would be shouting crucify him. And yet he chose to come. He chose to enter into that space. And so today um, we remember as the beginning of this holy week, the way that Jesus pursues us, the way that Jesus comes to us, and he came from heaven to earth to be our Savior. And if you're someone who's still exploring faith in Jesus, I want you to know that we worship uh, a God who moves towards us, who pursues us, that he's not just waiting for us to get good enough to come to him, but even while we were still sinning against him and shaking our fist at him, he came to us. And we celebrate that today. So we have a special call to worship today. We're going to have uh, Dean come forward with the shofar. And the shofar was always a way of announcing something, the beginning of something. Uh, It was a way, it it reminds us of the announcement of a coming king. It's it's an announcement of a call into worship, of a a new season, of, of the way that God has made a way for us. It's a call that's meant to wake us up the sound of the shofar to wake us up to the reality of the, the coming king uh, who has come and is coming again. And so would you stand and uh, I'm going to pray and then Dean's going to call us into worship with the shofar. Let's ask the Lord to help us worship this morning. Father in heaven, we're so grateful today that you came, that you moved towards us, that you came into that city even though you knew that the people's praise would be fleeting. Even though you knew what was to come, you came. You set your face purposely towards Jerusalem and you set your face now purposely towards us and you invite us to meet with you. You have sent the Holy Spirit to be here with us and we just welcome your presence. Would you, Holy Spirit, wake us up this morning? Physically, wake us up if we didn't sleep enough. Emotionally, spiritually, wake us up to the reality that the king has come. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who has come in the name of the Lord. We bless you. We praise your holy name, Jesus. Wake us up now to the reality of the gospel. We ask in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said... So this morning, I'm going to start service a little differently. We're going to start a cappella as we sing out Hosanna with a, with an older song that many of you might know, some of you may not, but we're going to sing Hosanna this morning and imagine ourselves on that 
very special Palm Sunday when Jesus entered into the city. So, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We sing, Lord, we lift. Lord, we lift up your name with our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, my God. Hosanna in the highest. We're going to sing that from the top one more time. And let's wave those palm fronds nice and proud. I don't typically ask you guys to do this kind of stuff. So I'm going to ask you this morning. It's a special Sunday, right? We're going to sing Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Up your name with our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O oh Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. All right, now if you're not comfortable waving them, you don't have to. You can continue if you want, of course. But let's sing out praises rising. Praises rising. See you, we find strength to face. 
And um, but before we do that, I wanted to read a section from Isaiah. Sorry, the mic. Uh, Isaiah 59 it says, uh, "Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear." but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin's a serious thing. Uh, so let's confess because we have a serious savior who can save us from this problem. Father, Thank you for the gift of confession. Thank you that you want us to come to you in spirit and in truth, to come as we are, not pretending. And Lord, yes, <laughs> we are sinners. We've damaged others by our words, by our deeds, by our withdrawal of help. We've damaged ourselves by our own self-talk and just doing things that damage ourselves. And Father, we... <laughs> We confess the sins are too many to count. But Father, I thank you that you've provided us with the perfect lamb. Lord, when, when people in the Old Testament brought a lamb to the priest as a sin offering, the priest didn't inspect them. They, they came as sinners. The priest inspected the lamb. And we have the best lamb, spotless, perfect in all ways. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you who knew no sin, had no sin, did no sin, became sin for us, so that we, in this amazing substitution, may become the righteousness of God in Christ. Thank you, Lord, that your heart towards us is love. Thank you, Lord, that your cross is powerful, powerful to save. And thank you, Lord, that you don't inhabit our grumblings you inhabit our praises and i praise you lord that you are our savior and so i declare church for those of you who are in christ you are forgiven not because of something you've done but because of what he did a perfect work on the cross which can never be taken away from you you are forgiven you are loved you're cherished he sings over you, and the melody that he sings is Christ. Amen. I'm going to continue in worship this morning, so you can stand if you're able or if you desire. Um, but you can also stay seated, whatever posture you'd like to take this morning as we continue in worship.
end this with the doxology this morning, but we're going to sing the new doxology, so there's going to be just a, a few more verses in there, but it's all going to be the same tune. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the His crown and kingdom never end. Now and throughout eternity, all praise the one who died for me. As you approached Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday so long ago, you knew what was ahead of you. You understood that those who greeted you with hosannas and blessings would change their words to words of condemnation within the week. You knew that the 12 who spent the previous three years with you in ministry would flee from you, deny you, and one would even betray you. Yet you loved them. You gave them the opportunity to continue participating in ministry alongside you that very week, fetching the donkey, sharing a meal with others in the community, and celebrating the Passover. Similarly, you love us despite our having fickle hearts, being easily distracted, self-focused, and fearful. You give us the opportunity to walk with you, to be in ministry alongside you, to bear words of hope to the despairing, to share a meal with others, to affect our community with kindness and acts of peace. You are the source of all peace and blessing. There is no true unfailing hope outside of you. We thank you and praise you for your gracious gift of presence in our life, for showing us that there is hope at the end of trials that nothing is beyond your ability to redeem. You brought life out of the crucifixion. How much more can you redeem conflict, viruses, injustices, and even war? But we must be willing. The disciples needed to be willing to go fetch the donkey, to enter a stranger's home for a meal, to walk to the Mount of Olives. O oh Lord, soften our hearts and sharpen our ears. Open our eyes, loosen our tongues, that we might be your ambassadors of hope, shalom, and love in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, schools, and city. Keep us awake and not complacent, nor paralyzed by our own expectations for ourselves. Fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Guide us in caring for the sick, the foreigner, the widow, and single parent. 
as well as for your creation. Mold us into a people transformed by your spirit to live out your call out of our great love and overwhelming gratitude for your love for us. Help us to live as your new creations, remembering that if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. Let us pray together now, united in Jesus, the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 What a privilege today, even just to kind of tone it down a little bit, right? And to just remember, uh, it's just good, just good. I'm grateful. Thank you, Josh and team. It's my privilege right now to invite some new members to come up. So if you're a part of that crew, I'm going to move some things around, and you come up and just join me up here on the top step here, new members. It's our privilege to welcome new members into the life of the church today. And, um, you know, we are, we, you don't have to be a member to be a part of our church. What membership is is an opportunity to, to really make a public expression of commitment and faith. Come on up here, guys, all, all the way up here to done this service. And, um, I, and you might just kind of just... Just, yeah, you'll figure it out. You're very, you guys got it. And, uh, um, and so we're grateful. We're grateful for everybody. Let's make room for the Piraeus to come on up. And there you go, Andrew, you can stand behind somebody. You're big enough. Okay, so um, church, look at this crew of new members in the life of our congregation. So uh, I'm going to let them do something we didn't do in the first service. We're going to mix it up, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you. uh, And um, and also just, I think, just say how long you've been a part of, like how long you've been around First Press, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody get that? Your your first and last name, how long you've been a part of First Press. I'd love to ask like seven more questions, but we've got a baptism to get to, so we're going to get to that. But why don't you guys just introduce yourself? um, No, you can hold the mic and then pass it down. Does that work? Thanks, Teresa. I'm Teresa. Oh, we'll make sure it gets on. Hello. Hello. He's going to find it. He's going to find it. There it goes. I'm Teresa Leonard, and I've been coming since around last September. Awesome. I'm Sheila. (coughs) My voice. (laughs) I'm Sheila Perkins, and I've been coming for about three or four years. Awesome. I'm Grace Ahn. I'm from South Korea. I stayed here for 80 days last year, and then I came here again on January 19th. Yeah, thank you. Kevin Evans, and we came Easter Sunday out in the parking lot. That was our first day. And I'm Teresa Evans. Kent Robinson, uh, this was about November. Mm-hmm. Last year, yeah. Christy Robinson. Julie Warrens, and we've been coming here for four to five years. Mm-hmm. I'm Charlie Warrens. Mm-hmm. Andrew Love, and we've been attending, or we've been attending for about two years now. Aubrey Love. Mm. Jesse Guzik. And I'm Andrew Guzik. We've been coming since about November. Hello, I'm Carlin Cadrill. My husband and I have been coming since Father's Day 2021. And I'm Jean Cadrill. <laughs> I'm Chrissy, and this is Jit, and we've been coming since last year in June. Awesome. We have a few people in the life of this group who are also on our staff. Chrissy serves as our nursery coordinator. Thank you. And um, others are wondering, am I going to get hired right now? No, you're not getting hired. But this is Teresa Leonard. Teresa is also on our staff. She serves in communications and administrative support uh, role. So yeah. 
Now, in the, in the first service, I asked them all the official questions of membership, and we made it all official. So what we get to do in this service is celebrate a baptism for one of these new members. Last week, we had the privilege of baptizing Emily, and, uh, and Emily was planning to be here, but some illness got in the way of that this morning. And so, but today we get a chance to baptize Andrew. So here's what I'm going to do. You guys are kind of the cloud of witnesses, right? So, right, I'm going to encourage you. You see where the baptismal font is. Andrew and Aubrey, you stay where you are, but would everybody else, would you kind of just fill in back there by the drums and just kind of be, just, I want you guys to stay up here as part of this. Um, and I'm going to keep using this mic. Uh, so this is Andrew Love the Third. You know what that means, right? That means there's Andrew Love the first, and then Andrew Love the second. And also in the nursery right now, probably, yes. is Andrew Love the fourth, yep. right? And, um, and Andrew, it's our privilege to participate together in your baptism today. That baptism is a sign of God's incredible work to draw you to himself to redeem you, to wash you clean of your sin. To, for us, that baptism is not so much about our decision for Jesus, but it's about his decision for us and our responding to that incredible move that he made towards us. So tell me a little about your life. Your t- I mean, we don't have time for the whole story, but just um, tell me, what's, what's this mean to you today? This means everything to me today. Um, I actually grew up in a small town, Sonora. Um, I went to a Pentecostal church for most of my childhood life. And um, unfortunately, when I was a teenager, uh, some family tragedies had occurred that caused a a rift in my family and for everybody to kind of split up and fall away from the church. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, myself included, um, that happened to me as well. And most of my 20s, I lived selfishly, just for myself, trying to forget what had happened. And instead of turning to God, I turned to other things. And it led me down a path that I didn't necessarily want to be. And then, thank God, I met my wife in my late 20s. And she was on her her own faith story journey. And um, she kind of rekindled something that I had uh, long forgotten. And um, when we moved to Fresno, we started hunting for a church, and that's when um, Connie and John Thacker and Christina and David Parker invited us here. And uh, the first day we showed up, we, we looked at each other and we knew we had found the home we'd been looking for. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the rest of the day is history. Uh, we wanna be members and give back and help others the way Jesus and all of you have helped us. Mm, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, my temptation right now is to just, uh, but I'm just going to go. So, uh, so I had the privilege of hearing Aubrey's story a little bit as well. And part of that journey for Aubrey, as I just listened to your story, Andrew, and the power of the invitation, the power of invitation, come and, and see what God is doing here and how powerful that can be, that, that invitation in. And Aubrey has a story of when she was uh, not necessarily walking with the Lord, but feeling a sense of the Lord's work. She's, Aubrey's a hairdresser. And, and one day there was a woman that she worked on and, and that woman then the next day called back and that was a little bit strange, you know, like then and said, can I take you to lunch? And that was not a normal occurrence for a random customer to say, can I take you to lunch? Yeah, she wanted to say no, but um, as they were walking from uh, the place and over, uh, you know, the small talk, but in the grocery store where they were grabbing lunch, the woman finally just stopped and was like, okay, I just have to tell you, the Lord told me to tell you that he's after you, that he loves you, that he wants you to come home. And... um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So just just the power, what I love about that is just a stranger's prompting of the Spirit and following the prompting of the Spirit and just being obedient to do what the Lord wanted to do. And that that was a huge moment in Aubrey's life and journey. And uh, here they are together and we're so grateful. And now there's Andrew Love the Fourth, and uh, we celebrate him and we celebrate the new life that Christ has given both of you in him and the coming home. Uh, back to your roots. It starts with a P. We're not Pentecostal, but we're Presbyterian, and we got a, we got a little Presbycostal in us as well. So the Holy Spirit is here, and, um, and we're experiencing him even now. So, Andrew, come on over, brother, and uh, kneel down right here. Aubrey, you can stand nearby or uh, wherever you want to be. And, um, and let me just ask you what your full name is. Andrew Theodore Love the Third. 
Andrew Theodore Love III. I invite you to not tip your head down there. It's my privilege, brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's not much for it to stick to up here, Andrew. (laughs) Brother in Christ, baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may you forever remember that the Lord is with you, that he loves you, that he's pursued you, that he's called you his own, that he has redeemed every broken thing, that he is restoring all things for his glory, and that he's called you to be a part of it. May you be his faithful disciple today and always in the community of the saints. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said? Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to do what I did in the first service now. We're going to pray for these guys, but I'm going to actually ask them to go down the center aisle, and they're all like experts at it now. They know, they have the vision, they understand that we're kind of spreading out. And would you stand up and kind of move towards the center? And if you're comfortable putting an arm on a shoulder, or um, I can, I, you don't need to worry about me helping you. I can help you. So uh, spread out and, um, and grab, uh, just put your hand on the shoulder. Let's welcome and pray over these new members in the life of our congregation. Perfect. Let's pray. Father, we just had a privilege of hearing a tiny little piece of Andrew and Aubrey's story. But I'm so grateful that every single person standing right now in the center aisle is a person who bears a story of your grace and of your pursuit and of your love and of your salvation. Thank you that each one of them knows you Thank you that you've called them to be a part of First Presbyterian Church Fresno. Some of them never imagined that they'd be a part of a church with such a long name. And here they are. Here they are. We're so grateful. Thank you for this community that surrounds them now. May we together pursue the mission that you've given us. May you empower these new members to enliven us as a congregation even more and strengthen us and encourage us and open up new opportunities and new ways, God, that you would, as you change us as a congregation, as you rebuild us together, God, that you would inspire us together as a whole community to pursue the mission of loving God, loving neighbors, making disciples and pursuing shalom, all so that we can see that vision that you've given us that we would see more and more and more in Fresno as it is in heaven. Use these new members and all of us for that great and wonderful and marvelous end promised to us in Christ Jesus. We ask for it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. 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 As you return to your seats, we're going to continue in worship. Please direct your attention to the screens. Good morning, church. My name is Robbie and I am the junior high assistant here at First Press. We are so glad you're here in person or online. We wanna share just a few ways you can connect and engage with us. If you're in the sanctuary this morning and sitting closest to the center aisle of your pew, please help us out. Grab the blue friendship pad, sign it, and pass it down when it gets to the end. Pass it back towards the center. If you're watching online, please take a moment to fill out the virtual friendship pad, which you will find directly underneath the live stream on YouTube, or you can scan the QR code on the bottom of the screen. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week. Please join us for a reflective evening on Monday, Thursday, April 14th at 7 p.m. as we remember Jesus' instructions at the Last Supper with his disciples and his great sacrifice for us. Remembering the suffering sets us up to fully celebrate Christ's resurrection Easter Sunday. On Easter, worship times are a regular schedule, 9 a.m. classic and 10.45 modern. Fill your cup coffee will happen after each service. We're also setting up a photo booth area for those amazing annual Easter pictures. Last call to beautify our sanctuary for Easter Sunday by purchasing lilies to honor or remember someone special. The deadline is tomorrow, Monday, April 11th. If you're with us this morning, you can grab an order form from the sanctuary entry or use the QR code in the bulletin to place your order. We also have a link in our website to, online, to the online order form. Access it from the Easter Lilies image right on our homepage. In a galaxy far, far away, 
a church named FPC decided to mix things up with a Star Wars themed family fun night for all Kingdom Kids families. Use your hyperdrive to get to the Fellowship Hall from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. on Friday, May 6th for a family-friendly galactic night of Star Wars themed food, games, and a prize for the best costume. Please RSVP to Margie or Emily so we'll have plenty of food and goodies. We're grateful for your generosity in giving of your tithes and offerings. Whether reoccurring or a one-time gift, everything you give fuels the mission and ministries of our church body. Remember, you can give online by text or by check. Please join us as we continue in worship. Give it up for Robbie and his announcements. Way to go. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. Really proud of you, brother. Um, hey, I encourage everyone to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. If you need help finding that, please grab your pew Bible. It looks like this. It should be right in front of you. It's on page 754. We're in the middle of a series called Rebuilding Together, looking at these two chapters, uh, these two books of the Bible called Ezra and Nehemiah. And Nehemiah tells the story of a Jewish man named... Nehemiah, okay, good, just making sure you're still with me. And uh, Nehemiah was a, a Jewish man who served as the cupbearer to the Persian king. The Persian king was named Artaxerxes at the time, and that was a very prestigious role for him. That, that meant he lived in the palace or near the palace, and he served the king and had close relationship with the king. But, but while he was serving in the comfort of the king's palace, the city of Jerusalem... The city of God's people was in ruins. The, the wall and the gates were nothing but rubble and charcoal. And when Nehemiah heard about that afresh, God put a vision in his heart. A, a vision that cut him to the cut him deep. I'm not sure if you've ever had a vision like that. A, a vision that kind of ruined him, a burden for that vision to become true. A vision for the city and for the health of the city and for what that could mean. Because when the walls and the gates of a city were broken down, that meant the city was broken down. That meant the city wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And then after God gave him that vision in the, in the beginning of these, in the early chapters, we hear how the king gave him permission to go and blessed him to go back from where he was in the city of Susa, way over in modern day Iran, and then came to uh, Jerusalem to, bring, to kind of lead an effort to rebuild the city wall. And last week we heard about how that went. I want to put up a, like a, a, just a, a very simple sketch of the shape of the wall during that time. The temple is kind of right at the top. We're going to hopefully put that little sketch up. It should be. There it is. So the temple is up that, on the northern part where the temple is. That would be the highest place uh, in, the, in the city there. And it kind of goes down the hill there. And, and, and they started, according to Nehemiah chapter 3, everybody was working together. They started up there at the sheep gate on the northern end. And then, it, and then Nehemiah tells us, every single group that, that went around and, and built on that wall all the way around the whole thing. And so in Nehemiah 3, we have this high point, this wonderful moment when like everybody's working and morale is high and spirits are high and confidence are high, is high. And then Nehemiah chapter 4 happens. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, the resistance or the opposition comes. And here's what I think is so important for us as we look at this chapter. Anytime we pursue a God-given vision, there will be opposition. Whenever we pursue a God-given vision, there will be opposition. I'm not just trying to be like, you know, uh, the, the person with all the bad news, the doomy and gloomy guy. But I'm just trying to be honest. The Bible teaches us this, that if you are a follower of Christ Jesus, pursuing a God-given vision in your life, then you will face opposition for the rest of your natural life. And the question is, the question is, what do we do with that? How do we respond? How do we endure? And that's what I think this chapter four of Nehemiah can really help us today. So may God open our minds and our hearts to hear what he has to tell us in this, his holy word. Nehemiah chapter four, hear now God's holy and awesome word. When Sanballat heard that, they, that we were rebuilding the wall, this is Nehemiah's own voice, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the jewels, the, the jewels, <laughs> sorry. He ridiculed the Jews. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? 
Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps of rubble and burned as burned as they are? And Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they, are, what, are they, what they are building, even if a fox climbed up on it, he would break down the wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. And then the Jews who live near them came to us and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles and officials and the rest of the people, this work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards who with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when we went for water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we're so grateful today for the way we've already experienced your presence among us. And we just thank you for the testimony of lives changed. Would we also, from today's message, be testimonies of lives changed? That this um, ancient text would not just be an ancient text, but by your spirit, you would bring it to life. That it wouldn't just be stuff to know, but God, that we would be changed as your people. So come Holy Spirit and change us, shape us, equip us, empower us to endure. We ask in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. Amen. So we have Nehemiah leading this massive rebuilding effort. And as he does it, it um, the neighbors hear about it and they get upset. They get angry and they begin to come against that effort. And in this text, there's, there's, there's like, it's like a tennis match almost. There's like opposition and then response. Opposition, response, opposition, response, opposition, response. So there's actually four kind of scenes here of the opposition and then the response, the opposition and the response, the opposition and the response, the opposition and response. You get it? Okay. So what I want to do is look at each of those scenes briefly, and, and there's some things I think we can pull out from each of them uh, uh, that we see in those, in those scenes that helps us know what it means to be people who face opposition. So let's start by looking first at the, at the first scene. It's verses 1 through 6. Look at verses 1 through 6. So the first neighbor that's listed there is Sanballat. We've heard Sanballat's name before earlier in Nehemiah. He's the neighbor to the north. And when he hears about the rebuilding project, he gets furious. Why does he get so furious? Why is he so mad? What's his problem? Well, it doesn't exactly say, but what I imagine is that the stronger Jerusalem became, the less advantage their neighbors could take of them. The stronger they became, the less advantage their neighbors could take of them. Like the office bully doesn't like it when other people start getting more powerful because that means the office bully is losing power. And that's, I think, what we have here. The neighbors don't want to see Jerusalem get stronger because then they can't take advantage of the neighbors as they used to. 
And so they get furious and he begins what his first level, the first kind of opposition that comes is a verbal attack, right? It's a ridicule attack. It's biblical trash talk at its, at its finest. It's a psychological warfare tactic. You know, they're basically, he's like, what do these puny little Jews think they're doing? Do they really think they can rebuild Jerusalem? Do they think they can just say a prayer and magically make the wall appear? Right? And then his friend Tobiah jumps in. Uh, and Tobiah, you know, he, he brings it, his, his, his version. He's like, even a little tiny fox could break down that wall. I mean, what a pathetic excuse for a wall. Right? It's a verbal attack. It's insult. It's, it's psychological warfare. It's trying to get in their heads. But notice how Nehemiah responds. Before we do that, let me just say that that I think this is important for us to recognize because these are the kind of lies that come against us all the time. And notice how they're exaggerating. A tiny little fox? Really? No, of course a tiny fox can't break down the wall of stones. But so often we believe the exaggeration of the enemy. We believe the exaggeration of the opposition, what it says to us. Don't believe it. It's not true. Look how how Nehemiah responds, verse 4. It's a bit jolting in the text because without any prophets, all of a sudden it's just suddenly he's praying, right? He moves right into prayer. Nehemiah understands that the battle belongs to the Lord. So Nehemiah doesn't attack back to them. He doesn't strike back. He doesn't try to come up with an insult that tops theirs. Oh, yeah? Well, right? No, he doesn't do that. What's he do? He prays. Nehemiah prays. Here's the first point. When you're feeling opposition in your life, when you're feeling under attack in your life, what's the first thing you should do? You should pray. When you feel the attack, pray. Don't delay, pray. When you feel the opposition, pray. Don't respond with your own vitriol. Don't try to make the other person feel small so that you can feel bigger than they are. Don't try to enact your own vengeance. Pray. The battle belongs to the Lord. When the opposition comes, pray. And then notice how Nehemiah prays. Oh, this is a serious prayer, right? This is not just a little rub-a-dub-dub, God thanks for the grub kind of a prayer. This is not a nice little prayer. No, Nehemiah understands how serious this is. So he, he prays in a way that might be disturbing for us, actually. He, he prays for God's justice to be done. He prays for God that God will have his way with the enemy. He prays that God will shut down their lies. The way that we fight through opposition is through prayer. But remember, it is a fight. We're facing opposition. When you're facing opposition, come to the Lord with strong prayers. Why? Because we have a strong enemy. It's not that person in your office who's trying to sabotage your work. It's not that other person who's talking bad about you to the friends. The Apostle Paul says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers. It's against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's serious. We have a strong enemy who prowls like a lion and, and wants to steal and destroy and kill. So we need to come against him with strong prayers. God, bring your justice to bear. God, cut off the influence of the devil and all his lies. God, deliver us from the evil one like Jesus taught us to pray. Don't miss this, church. Whenever we pursue a God-given vision in our work or in our marriages or in our neighborhoods or in our church or in our personal lives, there will be opposition. There's an enemy who doesn't want that to succeed. So, beloved, when there is opposition, pray. It's the best way to fight against the opposition. Pray. And I'm just praying that the Lord will help us to get that, but I also want the Lord to really help us get this next thing. So opposition rose up. Nehemiah prays, and then what happens? Look at verse 6. Very simple, little straightforward verse, but I love it. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Did you see that? Opposition came, Nehemiah prayed, and then we rebuilt the wall. They, they, here's point number two. They continued to do what the Lord had called them to do. They just continued to do what the Lord had called them to do. When opposition rose up, Nehemiah prayed, and then they continued to do what God had called them to do. Sanballat and Tobiah launched their psychological attack. Nehemiah prayed. They rebuilt the wall. Everyone worked with all their heart. He prayed, and they continued. In other words, they didn't take a break. 
They didn't run and hide. They didn't give up. They didn't abandon the cause. When opposition arose, they prayed and then continued. They prayed and continued. So many times we have a tendency to quit as soon as a little opposition comes up, don't we? As soon as the opposition comes up, we think, oh, there's some, I'm doing something wrong. Or, and, and, you know, sometimes the Lord speaks to us in, about things that he wants to correct. But, but here, the opposition coming from the enemy, they did not give up. Nehemiah reminds us to pray and continue. Pray and continue. Pray and continue. When the opposition arises, beloved, don't quit what you're doing. Pray and continue to rebuild to keep working, to do what the Lord has called you to do. We actually see that pattern again in the next section. The next section, the next scene is verses seven through nine. That's kind of the first scene we just did. Now, second scene is seven through nine. And here, the, now the opposition is growing. Did you notice that? Opposition's bigger, and it also is more intense. The Arabs, the Ammonites, the men of Ashdod, uh, these are, they're surrounded now. And it didn't just grow in number, it grows in intensity. Look at verse eight. They plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Another translation says to stir up confusion amongst the people, to come and fight. And how did Nehemiah and his crew respond? Verse nine, same thing. They prayed and then what? They posted a guard. They prayed and posted a guard. This is faith. Trust and action together is faith. Trust and action together. They prayed and then they set a guard. They prayed and then they did what they could do themselves. They didn't just do what they could do themselves without praying. They didn't just pray and do nothing. They prayed and set a guard. They prayed and continued. It's the same thing again. And then look at the next scene, scene three. I'm moving quickly because I need to. Verses 10 through 14. Scene three, verses 10 through 14. And this is kind of the apex of the opposition because now look what's happened. Look at that carefully. Now you have the opposition not only from the enemy, but now there's something brewing within, right? Verse 10 shows doubt from within. I don't, I don't think we have the strength to do this. I, I mean, I don't, look, we can't even get around all the rubble how, how can we rebuild this wall there's doubt brewing have you ever experienced that in the midst of opposition i have there's doubt, there's doubt brewing internally verse 11 shows the opposition from the enemy and and now now it's even it's even more intense they're not even going to see us coming and we're going to kill them all and that's how we're going to stop it that's a little bit more intense then we're going to fight and cause some confusion now we're going to kill them all and put an end to it and then also verse 12 shows, shows fear. Fear from the Jews, who not, not the ones who were working on the project, but Jews who lived around the area, around those enemy territories, so to speak. And they, they were saying that, you know, like wherever we turn, they're gonna attack us. Like there's no hope. They had fear. And but look how Nehemiah responds in verse 14. Here, it, you know, it, there's a strategy here after putting families together to guard the most vulnerable parts of the wall, which is fascinating and awesome. We don't have time to really talk about it. Nehemiah does what? He points them to Yahweh, their God. Look at verse 14. He gives them a two-sentence sermon. If you, you can only dream of a two-sentence sermon. <laughs> don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. That's so good because, because when opposition arises, not only do we need to pray and then continue to do what God has called us to do, but point number three, we also need people in the community to encourage us with the truth. We need people in the community. We need to be a part of the community where we can hear what is true in the midst of opposition. We need to be people who speak what is true. The workers were tired Right? The workers are, the people are starting to doubt. Everyone is starting to be afraid. The opposition is getting more and more intense. What's going to happen? Nehemiah does, Nehemiah, listen to this. He sees, he stands, and he speaks. Did you see that? Verse 14. He sees, he looks around, he notices what's happening, he sees, and then he stands up, it says, and he speaks. He, he proclaims, he declares, he, he speaks to them the truth. 
that the Lord is great and awesome. Beloved, we need to be people who see each other. We need, to be people, we need people who see each other. We need to be people who see each other. And, and people that when we see each other getting tired or discouraged or dismayed, there's been some of that these last couple of years, hasn't there? We need to be people who are willing to stand up in that moment and speak words of encouragement. Speak the truth. And notice really importantly here, notice the focus, the focus or the, the center point of his encouragement. He doesn't say, Guys, remember how great we are in battle, how great an army we are. He doesn't say, hey, remember how awesome of a builder you are. He doesn't say, remember the incredible strategy that we created. No, the focus of his encouragement is on the Lord, not on the person. He doesn't say, don't worry, you're awesome, you're great, you can handle it, you can do it. No. He says, don't be afraid because the Lord is great and awesome. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome especially when we're in the midst of opposition, church. We need people who are willing to speak the truth of the gospel into our lives. We need to learn ourselves how to speak the truth of gospel to us. We have to learn how to say it to ourselves. We need to learn to remember. There's such power in remembering the truth of the gospel, to remember that the Lord is great and awesome. We need to remember, as Nehemiah says in verse 20, that our God will fight for us. And we need to speak the truth to one another. So whenever we pursue a God-given vision, there will be opposition. But in Nehemiah 4, when that opposition rose up, they prayed, they continued to do what God told them to do, and they spoke God-centered encouragement into the situation. And then lastly, for they, God intervened. God intervened. Let, let, let's look at the last, the last scene, the last verses uh, 15 to the end, make up that final and fourth scene. Look at verse 15. It says, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. So who frustrated their plan? God. God did it. Nehemiah continues to make God the hero of the story here. God intervened. God won the day. God frustrated their plans. God was victorious over the enemies of his plan. They prayed. They continued their work. They spoke words of God-centered encouragement, and God intervened. And God confused the plan. And I hope that you see that, though, as just a foretaste of the ultimate victory that we have in Jesus. How does this apply to us? Jesus came to show us who God is and how to live God's way. Jesus lived as the perfect human being in every single way. But, when, but whenever uh, anyone pursues a God-given vision, there will be opposition. Jesus faced opposition, didn't he? If ever you're insulted or slandered, you're not alone. The Son of God was insulted and slandered. If ever there's been a plot to take you down, you're not alone. There was a plot to kill and murder Jesus. And when that attack reached its peak, when the, the cries of the crowd were no longer Hosanna, but were now crucify him, the spotless Lamb of God did not show himself. He, he, he did not, so to speak, show his power and his glory. He showed the glory by staying silent. And he surrendered to their schemes. And he submitted himself to the Roman cross. As Taraj reminded us earlier, the one who had no sin took our sin upon himself and surrendered to death. And it looked like defeat. The disciples, I'm sure, were afraid and hopeless. And yet, ultimately, it was an incredible victory. For he had paid that ultimate price to atone for our sin. And on the third day, God affirmed that. God vindicated him. God raised Jesus back to life forever victorious over sin and death and all its effects. Beloved, Jesus has won the battle. And when you surrender your life into his hands, no matter how you've lived, no matter what you've believed, when you surrender your life into his hands as your Savior and your Lord, you are guaranteed to be included in his victory. Hallelujah. Yeah. Remember that the Lord is great and awesome. 
Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Jesus is the ultimate intervention of God for your redemption and for your restoration and for the restoration and for every single one of us who puts our faith in him. We can be a part of that. We can be a part of that victory when we surrender to the resurrected king of heaven and earth. And so remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Part of what we do in the midst of opposition is we remember the one who has conquered it all. But I want you to notice one last, one last thing in the last couple minutes here. One last thing in Nehemiah 4. Even, this is fascinating to me. Even after God frustrated the enemy's plan, the chapter doesn't just end there, does it? Verse 15 God frustrated their plan. It says they went back to work, but they didn't go back to work in the same way anymore, did they? Even though, the, even though the opposition had been frustrated, they went back to work a different way. They worked on the wall with one hand and they held a weapon with the other hand. The builders kept their swords on them all the time. Half of them worked and half of them stood guard. They didn't even change their stinky clothes so they could always be ready for an attack, right? They stayed ready for the opposition to engage or to emerge or to come again. Beloved, whenever we pursue a God-given vision, we will have what? Okay, I've said it like a thousand times already in this sermon. I used to, when, whenever we pursue a God-given vision, we will have opposition. Even if that God-given vision is just a simple little vision of, I'm gonna live my life, surrender to you, Jesus. When we, make a, when we pursue a God-given vision, there will be opposition. Jesus said to his disciples, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And if they persecuted me, they're gonna persecute you also, Jesus said. They're gonna treat you that way because of my name, for they don't know the one who sent me. And then later he said at the end of that talk, he said, I've told you all these things so that you may have peace in me. In this world, you're gonna have trouble, Jesus said. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Beloved, whenever we pursue a God-given vision, we will have opposition. So when it comes, when it comes, not if it comes, when it comes in your life, don't attack the person. Attack the opposition in prayer. Don't give up the vision, but continue to do what the Lord has called you to do. Work at it with all your heart in the midst of that opposition. Don't start thinking that the weight of the world is on your shoulders, that, that you have to conquer, that you have to succeed, that you have to prove yourself. No, remember the Lord who is great and awesome, the great conqueror of all evil. Speak that truth to yourself and to others when there's fatigue and disillusionment and fear. And finally, believe the promise of God. Believe the promise of God. One day, the king is coming again. The living king, the resurrected king. And when he returns, he's going to bring everything into alignment with his kingdom. A day is coming when there will be no more opposition. When there will be no more attack of the enemy. Hallelujah. But until that day, until that day, stay alert. Be on guard. Keep the sword with you at all times. And keep doing the thing that God has called you to do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we glorify you. We praise your holy and awesome name. We worship you for you are our champion. You have conquered it all. You have redeemed what is broken. You have rebuilt from the ashes and the rubble of our lives. You are taking this world and you are bringing your kingdom for a total restoration. You have conquered the grave. You have conquered sin. You are reigning above, high and exalted. And you will come again to bring everything under your lordship. So God, help us to trust in you. Help us to turn to you. Help us to continue to do what it is that you've called us to do. Help us to speak words of life to one another in the midst of it. And be glorified yourself as the champion of our lives. We ask it in Jesus' precious and holy and awesome name.
And everyone who agreed said, amen. I asked Josh, this wasn't in the bulletin, it wasn't planned, but I just asked Josh to come and lead us at least through part of the song champion. Would you stand and let's remind each other, remind ourselves of this truth. Proclaim Jesus as the champion to encourage us today going forward. I've tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. That you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve it. You take the broken thing, raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants for when you stand undefeated. that are going to be a part of the spring break trip to come forward and just stand up here. These guys are getting ready to serve this week. Not everybody's here right now, but they're going to be serving this week and, and building. If you're a part of that group, come on up and uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Even if you're going to just be a part of it in some way, shape or form, these guys are going to be serving this week in our city. It's their spring break and they're using it to serve. They're going to be participating in um, a wonderful project downtown here of uh, building 
small little homes that can help uh, be uh, connect the issues of affordable housing and, and end uh, homelessness. And so we're grateful for they're going to be swinging hammers and learning new trades and serving. They're going to be building with one hand and holding a weapon. No, but they're going to be <laughs> building with one hand and remembering the word of God and the other and uh, serving the Lord. We want to pray for them. They're probably going to face some opposition this week, don't you think? Yeah. There's going to be some fear. There's going to be some uncertainty, some doubt. They're going to wonder if they're making any kind of a difference. They, there might be some illness or sickness. There's going to be some opposition this week. And so we just want to encourage you guys to pray when the opposition comes and then continue to do what God has called you to do. And then be people who speak words of encouragement to one another about the truth of the Lord who is mighty and strong and awesome and great. And then trust that he's going to give victory. He's going to have his way. His kingdom's going to come. Maybe you're a person today who's in the midst of tremendous opposition or tremendous attack. The prayer team is here. Please come forward and pray. They'd love to just pray with you. We hope that you'll come back on Monday, Thursday, this coming Thursday night as we remember the mandatum, the new command. Mandi is uh, for the Latin word mandatum, which Jesus gives when he washes the feet of the disciples. He says, a new command, a new mandatum I give you, a new mandate I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. C come and celebrate with us on Thursday. It's a powerful way to enter into the holy weekend. And then Easter, Easter, Easter's coming. Who have you invited? Think about the testimony that you heard today. A lot of people will say, no, thank you. Maybe somebody will say yes. Nine o'clock, classic service, 1045, modern service. Let's pack this place out and be praying this week for the gospel to be made clear. So before you receive the benediction, would you reach out your hand towards these? God, we just pray your blessing over this group. We pray that they'll know your presence and strength. Help them to remember the Lord who is strong and awesome and mighty and great. We surrender their trip, their, their week of service to you. In Jesus' name, everyone who agreed said, amen. amen. And just stay right where you are, Gus. Don't go anywhere. And I want to just invite you to receive this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his perfect peace today and every day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, amen. go in his grace and strength.